Hi, Peter Balker here, and welcome to today's edition of The Transition Guy. Now, joining me today in the studio is Jason Kingsley, who is founder and CEO of The Rebellion Group. Welcome, Jason. How are you? Thank, I'm very well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's a, it's a little hot where we are, unseasonably warm in uh, here in the UK, but uh, it's rather nice as well. No, absolutely. And yeah, unseasonably warm. That is the word. Now, your story to me is a fascinating story because you wouldn't sort of appear to have been traditionally, what I would say, a gaming founder, CEO. Well, you couldn't really be when I was growing up because the games industry is so new that I was growing up uh, maturing as the games industry was being sort of founded or the very earliest foundations were being laid of technology. I can remember my my first, uh, the first computer we had at school took up about a third of a classroom in a, in a forgotten corner of a room. Um, and it, it had been donated by a big business. And I think it was probably about as powerful as most people's microwaves are today. It didn't have any visual display units. Uh, it, it was ticker tape. So it had that sort of punch tape. So you could make programs on it and you could take that program away with you rolled up in your pocket physically. So, so that was my first encounter with high tech. Um, and then my love of computers and my love of role playing games and fantasy, you know, reading books, uh, sort of combines to, to, to mean that computer games seem to be a good place to, to continue to explore. And the exciting thing was it was a, it was a, it was a new market. It's a, it's a new area of exploration. So rather than going into something else like medicine, which has been going for an awfully long time or, or, or veterinary science, which was always an, was an option for me. Um, I wanted to do the sort of creative entrepreneur uh, role. I, I, I saw myself doing that um, as much creative as it is entrepreneurial. Did you do, I mean, was that your journey? Did you know that you wanted to do that before you studied zoology? Well, I think, um, I think everybody's life is a little bit of a, a guided random walk. You know, things happen and opportunities come along and, and you can't guarantee that opportunities, opportunities will come along at the right time. What you can do is control your response to those opportunities and try and build on them and build on the success and embrace them or reject them as, as you see fit. Um, so I always, I always think where you end up in life or where your, your journey, because basically we all end up in the same place eventually, but you know, our, our journey to get there is about how we deal with the circumstances that, uh, that fortune flings at us. And that sometimes those things are awful and sometimes those things are really lucky and, and great. And, and other times they're neither. It's just what you make of them. So how did you end up starting a gaming company? Well, we were, my brother and I were very interested in computer games from an early, early era. We, we had a Commodore pet, um, but I, I also think it was slightly peer pressure to get a proper job. I right. go through a more conventional education system. You know, I did, I did uh, o -level, what are called O-levels, which are the, the exams you do, used to do at the age of about 16 in the UK. Then what are called A-levels, which are the ones you take two years later, which are around 17, 18. And then I went on to Oxford University to, to do a degree. And I did love animals and I loved the study of animals and I loved learning about animal behavior. It was a sort of passion for me. And that was reflected in my love of horses and training horses, which I'd had in my life since I was eight years old. So I was a, a very successful competitive horse rider at a very early age. By successful, I mean competing internationally and winning. Um, but it was far too expensive, uh, long term thing for my parents to be able to afford. But I still loved horses and I loved looking at how they behaved and like the way they responded to you. Um, and I had some skills in that area. So there was that as well. So zoology, getting a degree was a sort of sensible path, if you like, I guess a sort of a, a backup. If everything else fails, I can always go and get a job in a bank or something. Um, and then kicking off the games company was really a passion between you know, my brother and I. My brother's very much more technical than I am. And I was, I was more into the games design and art side. So between us in those early days, 
we could make computer games as the two of us. These days, it takes 250 or more people three years to make a, a big computer game. Um, but in those days, you could make it with two of you. Uh, and it just seemed like a fun thing to continue to explore rather than sort of giving up on dreams of trying something new actually give it a go until it proves you you can't do it too many of my colleagues had dreams at university of whatever doing some kind of exciting thing and then 10 years later you find them and they're sort of they're okay you know they're doing reasonably well uh you know they've not really pushed the boundaries they've got a sensible job and they've got a sensible lifestyle and and good for them you know but but i there's a there's a part of me that wonders when the child inside them died or when they first mm. noticed and, and i just think i think business should be combined with passion as well i think it's hugely important but it was a cottage in, when you started looking at gaming it was very much a cottage industry i mean you're talking about i mean i went down the commodore uh, the commodore 64 commodore amiga and they were like your mainstream gaming yeah. rigs yeah, there were a few and far between. You, shops didn't really, they, I don't really remember, but you could go and buy, you know, you, data was difficult to transport back in those days. I mean, for those that, that can't conceive of it, the internet didn't exist. You know, it was not possible. You could just about use phone lines um, uh, and it would sort of, you could almost hear the data. It was that slow. You know, it was literally, if you were a fast typist, you could probably get the data down the phone line as fast uh, as, so everything was, was on a physical medium. It still is to a certain extent now, you know, uh, on Blu-rays and that kind of thing. But back in that time, cassettes were a big thing, you know, storing data on, on what were effectively repurposed music cassettes was a big thing and and also the market was such that you had small ads at the back of computer games magazines yes. um for for games you didn't really know what you were buying you'd it would turn up and it would be in a, a ziploc bag and you'd load it up and you'd find something that was usually marginally disappointing but you know it was still it was still a kind of the early frontier of this massive medium that is computer games these days so was it just a hobby that you kind of wanted to just develop further at the time i never i i'm a i'm a funny one when people ask me about hobbies and things hobbies and work and lifestyle and you know life work balance i always think it's a bit of a sort of weird dichotomy because i can't i i wouldn't want to do a job that i didn't enjoy doing and i wouldn't want to do something that I didn't think was productive. So, so the idea of a, I've pretty much always turned my hobbies into a, into a business or, or, or rather professionalized them, not necessarily always to make money out of them, but to try to do them to the best of my ability. And as a result, sort of ended up somehow monetizing it or, or, or making it work for me in a different way. So, Yes, I mean, conventionally, you would say a lot of my, you know, I turned my hobby into my business, but I actually think that's probably a rather oversimplistic way of looking at it. I, I continue to build on my passion and almost by accident, it's become a big company. I mean, most of my entrepreneurship, I've had to learn on the job, as it were. Right. <laughs> I have never, you know, I've, I've tried to go on training courses and i just think you know you got it wrong because i've been in negotiations and that won't work or yeah that might work with certain types of people but it won't work with that kind you, you've got to you, you've got to have empathy when you're negotiating you've got to work out what the other what the other people are trying to achieve um you know if, if there's a log jam in negotiation try and work out what that log jam is all about because it's rarely about it's 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 rarely about uh the, the the fundamentals of the deal. If, if person A and person B want to do a deal, there's usually a reason they both want to do the deal. So what is it? What are the details that are getting in the way? And what are they trying to protect by a certain clause? Or what are they trying to guarantee by a certain clause? And why would you object or not to it? So I've gone off the, off the, off the thread a little bit there, but, but I feel that computer games were, were, were a hobby, but it was a lifestyle choice, perhaps, more than a hobby. No, no, I understand that. Uh, so how early into your entrepreneurial journey did Rebellion grow from just you and your brother? 
oh well we set we set up rebellion uh and we went to pitch to atari uh back in the day atari is an interesting company because it uh, it once bestrode the globe like a huge giant i mean it was it was the equivalent of i guess you could say it was like you know, the equivalent of google i suppose or yeah. something like that i mean in 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 terms of people's awareness it it was the thing it was it um and it had fallen on hard times it had collapsed and it, it was in slough we went to slough and if anybody uh knows the the the, the place in the uk called slough there's a very famous uh, poem i can't remember who it's by but it says come friendly bombs fall on slough um i mean i'm being unkind to the place but you know it's, it's very industrial it's an industrial structure uh, uh it's improved markedly over the last few decades but um back then it was very hardcore industrial chic let's put it that way um we went into a vastly oversized office um that was on you know it had fallen on hard times really to present um and i remember thinking this is amazing it had the it had hessian wallpaper for those of those of you that are old enough you probably don't remember but there was a sort of a, a flock kind of wallpaper that had a fabric component to it <laughs> and this was brown it was sort of 70s brown and it wrapped around the corners of this um of this reception area but of course it had worn out on the corners a little bit so it had frayed and it had gone through to the backing so it was very obviously um <laughs> very obviously passed its sell by date and i remember looking at that going that's just brilliant that's like something that's something out of history it's fantastic you know it, it, it once really expensive wallpaper is now frayed and torn on the corners and it it represented everything about the company atari exactly. at the time um but they were they were launching a new computer games platform called the atari jaguar um and they asked us to make some specific games for it um so we negotiated a deal said yes set things up they then halved the budget on us the week before starting <laughs> a sort of ambush negotiation tactic um, and we still went oh right well we've kind of committed to all of this so we better get on with it and try and do it and that was a very useful early lesson um negotiating from a position of weakness is is always harder than negotiating from a position of strength and most people actually do start negotiating from positional weakness and that's how they learn yes absolutely and and in a way you have to learn it would be absurd to you, you've almost got to do your apprenticeship in business you've you've almost got to have these war stories and have learned from them and gone through the mill of forming your 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 business um perspective and your business style there's an article by having bad experience yeah there's an article there the apprenticeship of getting screwed yes yeah, exactly know. right yeah and i think yeah we all we, we can recount these stories and i've got more than a few and some of them i still can't publish yet because you know um i can't release them yet one day maybe in my memoirs but um i think it would be crazy to not expect at the beginning of your business journey to not be on the receiving end of sharp practice it just yeah seems to be the way of the of, of the world there's probably a few lucky people that haven't been um but actually if you look into it you probably find they've got a very wealthy uh and powerful dad or mum behind them and that stop that protects them <laughs> protected them it a does, bit. yeah so in the early days you started off you did the atari gig and you grew from there how did you make sure you had the right team in place yeah, well, that's a difficult one. Um, I think typically I try to work with people I like um, and people that I get on with because life's a bit too short to work with people who have uh, incompatible um, personalities. Mm. Um, that doesn't mean you should work with people that always tell you yes. Uh, uh, that's different. I want to work with people that I get on well with, that I can have a conversation with, that we can have a bit of a to and fro uh, and, and, and have a difference of opinion and end up processing that difference of opinion and coming to a conclusion. I'm a, I'm a huge believer in um, emergent strategies, in talking to the team around you, because let's face it, you know, 
if you don't respect their opinion, what the bloody hell are you working with them for? You, you really, mm. you really shouldn't be working with people whose opinions you don't, you don't respect. Um, I, I would say it's an ongoing challenge to choose good people to, to, to work with. Um, and somebody might be really good on paper, but you just get a feeling they're not kind of, they, they won't slot into the organization properly, or maybe, maybe they're used to a different way of working or in our case chris and i are very hands-on um and very not sort of mba trained and very not process driven but outcome driven um and i think that can slightly wrong foot people i, I can remember uh, a member of staff who's who's with us t today hello matt coming in and um um he he'd just come from a major massive multinational and he he had it was his first presentation so he'd obviously spent a lot of time and energy on this he'd done a 30 page presentation he'd he'd sort of done the usual preamble and i i said to him is this powerpoint 30 pages and he went yes 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 and and i said well okay fine well, bear with me so he started and i said yeah yeah we know we know the setup we know what you're trying to establish can where do you start talking about options and solutions he said oh, oh on about page 15. I said, okay, fine. Can we just go to page 15? And his look on his face is slightly crestfallen. Okay, fine. So he skipped to page 15. I said, okay, yep, yeah, fine. I've got that. I've read it before you've even said anything. Right now, can we skip to your conclusions? And can we then have a conversation about your conclusions? And he said, really? I said, yes, let's get to the last page. Um, so we skipped to the last page. And we had a really interesting conversation about that. And he said, right okay that's uh substantially different than i'm used to <laughs> he said it's a real breath of fresh air though um he said that's great because you you got the issue i didn't need to go into too much preamble you understood the options you've completely understood what i would recommend and you've questioned a few things you've challenged it and you've modified it slightly and you you've just agreed with what i said and i mean yeah well we wouldn't why would we be paying you your salary if we didn't if we didn't appreciate your skills um, so he's never done a 30 page powerpoint ever again you know he he literally we come in with a with some bullet points for the conversation so you um, decorporatized him yes i think so I, I hope we haven't spoiled him for you know if he ever ha has to go back to that he's probably forgotten how to put 30 page powerpoints together but but i'm i'm a great believer in having meetings of the necessary length and get to the get to the point quite quickly mm. um I, I i dislike i think we've all been in committee meetings where somebody puts their hand up and they want to talk and they go i would just like to say that i fully agree with the last uh, speaker and i i want to wholly and he go just shut up and if you object say so if you don't object we'll assume you're okay with it move on i don't need to see hear you speak we're all busy um sounds like question I, time in parliament <laughs> exactly yes i would just like to speak really slowly and waste everybody's time for a bit longer. So um, yeah, I, 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 I believe in the necessary level of information exchange, whatever that is for the project at hand. So most entrepreneurs, I mean, they dream of scaling. They dream of seeing their business grow. How far into, how long after founding the business did you start to see it really grow? Well, almost immediately, actually. Um, I mean, if you think about rate of growth, it's probably the fastest at the beginning. You know, you come up with an idea and then the, by the time you've employed your first member of staff, you've, you've got a, an almost infinite growth rate at that, that very moment. But I, I would say by the time you've got your first office, you've got five or six people work there. Uh, plus, because one of the things I think with, it, with, with members of staff is you, it's not just them that you're affecting. You've got their relationships and their life as well and their partners children whatever it might be and it, so it suddenly becomes actually quite a big responsibility but i would say really the company has been at its biggest growth rate over the last 10 years because we moved over to self-publishing we moved over to making developing uh, releasing our own games direct with partners like sony microsoft steam and epic uh, and doing it largely digitally or a lot of it digitally we still do manufacture physical goods um but the the bulk of our work these days is is digital um and and that was a that was the biggest sea change because we went from pitching our services to other people 
to making games for people to buy. Yeah. Um, and so that's, that's been the biggest, biggest rapid change. Um, you talked about dreaming of scaling and I, I've, I, I dream about it the other way around, actually. Um, I dream about having just enough people to do the cool things I want to do and no more. I just, I, I, I it's a nightmare for me, the, the thought that the company would ever get so big that I couldn't know and enjoy the products and the ideas and the, the, the games that we were making or that something would be a surprise to me, right. the company. I, I wouldn't like that. I, I, we are big enough that I can't read all the books or read all the comics or play all the games throughout, you know, from start to finish. But I do try to do as much of that as possible because at the end of the day, I run rebellion because I want to do cool stuff, not because I want to build a company. Um, and that's sometimes confused people because that's not the traditional way of being an entrepreneur in, 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 in for some people anyway. Unless you end up building cool stuff that other people are really interested in. And then your business has a value proposition that forces it to grow. What challenges did you face when your business started to grow? Oh, finding the right people and integrating them. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges is, is when you are hiring very rapidly, how do you maintain the positive aspects of the company that's caused you to grow? How do you not dilute it? How do you, how do you keep the ethos and the um, spirit of things? without bringing a whole bunch of people in and, and, and losing the thing that that's allowed you to grow in the first place. So I would say, I would say onboarding people and, and helping them understand what makes the company great and getting them to share in that exciting journey as well, because it, 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 in an ideal world, everybody that works for you should be enjoying the process of, of, of creating something cool. Not always the case and not every day do I get up and go, oh, it's really exciting to be at work because there are always mundane aspects to any job, wherever you are. Um, and there's stressful ones and boring ones, but but I would hope that the, the bulk of people that work for me more often than not sort of enjoy their job and, and sort of appreciate it. Did you have any challenges along the way where you put the wrong people on board and it had a ne negative impact on what you were trying to achieve? Oh, crikey, yeah. I, I've had, I've had some, some, some doozies. Yeah, so I had, uh, had a, uh, I have to be careful I don't uh, breach any non-disclosure agreements. Uh, um, I have had members of staff who were stealing things from, uh, from the computers in the office. And... Um, wow. Well. One IT piece of the IT game. Well, where where are all these expensive graphics cards? I thought this computer had an expensive. It seems to have a low powered graphics card. And what this particular person turned turned out to be uh, have dependency, drug dependency issues, and was using right. was, was selling the high value graphics cards from the computer, replacing them with low value ones, arbitraging it. Um, and had been doing that for quite a few months. And nobody had really noticed until the pressure was on for the computer parts. And, and suddenly people were going, where are all these supposedly wizard graphics cards? Where have they all gone? So that was a shock when you realized that somebody who was in a position of trust was not worthy of that trust. Um, you know, we've, 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 we've had people um, less, less obvious case of criminality people who had a uh, uh, evening jobs for example were, were djs and we we typically allow people to to do things as long as it doesn't conflict with their main job but we had one particular chap was just not getting enough sleep because he was he was going clubbing and djing and and we had to sort of say to him look you know go clubbing on the Friday night and the Saturday night, and make sure you get your sleep on a Sunday because you've got to work on a Monday, you know, and, and there's a reason it's not, it, it's not like you're, you know, you're not doing your job, but also what you're doing is requiring all your colleagues to work harder to make up for your partying. And that isn't fair. No, um, uh, it's, it's, it's not right. And it's also not fair on, 
other members of staff who you're when you're snoozing on a Monday on a Monday morning because you 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 are up till six in the morning. And so, it can actually cause a lot of resentment if you're not careful. Hmm. Yeah, it has a knock on effect. And 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 people are saying, well, why is person X allowed to slack off on a Monday when I've got to do all the blooming work? And and that can cause retention issues. It causes, you know, can cause stress and anxiety because sometimes another member of staff who's doing their job diligently doesn't want to, you know, to report on somebody who's not doing the job, job diligently because they don't want to be seen as causing trouble. But it is causing trouble for them. Uh, and it's causing them stress and they might end up going. Mm. And the reason they're going is because they're very good and diligent, working hard, and they don't understand why somebody else is allowed to get away with it. So I think that there are, there are ramifications over and above somebody's poor performance that isn't just about their poor performance. Uh, it's about how other people perceive their performance as well. And that can be really destabilizing in a business. Yes, Absolutely. Yeah. What, do you, what do you think your biggest success has been within the business and how did you achieve it? Well, I would say just blooming staying alive as a business. I, I, to, to anybody out there who runs a business, big or small, that's still going, uh, especially in difficult situations like, uh, you know, a pandemic, congratulations. You know, just you, know, you might not be the biggest or most successful company in the world. And let's face it, only one company can be the biggest or most successful. But if you're just still going, well done. You know, that's difficult. Um, then I would say transitioning from working for other people to working with other people and making our own games and, and investing in our own in our own products and our own intellectual property. So that's really been the biggest change for Rebellion over time. Increased risk, but significantly increased reward when it goes well. Oh, that's a really good way of putting it. What, how important is personal growth as a CEO? Personal growth? Um, yeah, I'm funny like that. I don't really have a, a concept of personal growth. I, I've always spent my life doing things to the best of my ability that I enjoy, but the objective has never been to be the best. My objective is to do things, um, have experiences, enjoy it, and feel good about myself. Um, I've, I've never been particularly success driven. Um, it's a bit of a weird thing to say. I do like success. I do like winning. I do like being the best, but I also like doing things where I'm just achieving something hmm. or learning from the journey. Um, I liken, I liken it a little bit to training horses, for example. So I, I, I train horses from when they're born to performing high school dressage maneuvers and, and you know, rears and jumping in the air and that kind of stuff. I can do the whole thing. So I can watch a horse being born or see it first thing in the morning and it's just been born, it's just starting to walk. And in 10 years, see it performing athletic feats, which are absolutely astonishing. And I've kind of, I've allowed it to do that. I've taught it to do some of those things or or Im improved it enhanced it um and given it an opportunity and training a horse is a bit like running a business there is no real end game i suppose you could look at running a business and you float it and then you're done but that that isn't really the end of the business at all that's the the, the, the beginning of a new chapter in the business yeah. history so you know the, 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 i suppose the only end of a business is if you run out of money and have to close it down uh, but even then the idea can be reborn in another form or in a better form. Um, so I, for personal growth, I take on slightly uncomfortable new challenges uh, because I think the equivalent of going back to school is quite humbling and keeps you kind of welded to the ground a little bit. So. So recently I've started to dabble in horse archery, which may sound like a very specialist area, and it is. I'm very good at the horse riding stuff. I can do archery up to a point, but not combine, I've never combined the two. And suddenly combining the two, you suddenly realize, you suddenly realize you're an idiot at the beginning of a journey, which is actually a really good place to be sometimes, um, especially when you've achieved huge success in other areas. I think it's important to be taken back down right at the beginning and appreciate 
where you've come in other areas. Um, and I, uh, so, so I would say what I do for personal development is try and discover new challenges um, and, and try to make those happen. I find the horse and equestrian and history side of my uh, stuff, my, my YouTube channel, Modern History TV, is fairly successful. But I'm doing things like learning about how ordinary people lived their lives in the 14th century. I'm doing a lot of research into it and, and, it, and it trying to explain to an audience that the, the, they were the same as us. They had different levels of technology, though, and different right. expectations. And I find that quite interesting and exciting. I'm just reading at the moment, I'm reading about um, the uh, origins of the chariot. You know, chariots go back 3000 BC or longer. Um, and, you know, who's the first person to think of attaching a horse or, or an ass or a, you know, any creature to a set of wheels? And what were they thinking? And, and, and it massively changed, revolutionized warfare, transportation, you know, if you think about it, the, the ability to carry more, to, to transport more than your human being can carry at much greater speed and with much less effort was a massive change in the ability of that civilization or those yeah. people to achieve things. You know, it's a massive, it's a sea change. And, and we don't really know how it came about. Nobody can quite work out who invented or how wheels were invented. There are lots of theories and I guess we'll never know but I find that fascinating. How how did it revolutionise communications, for example? Um, anyway, sorry, I've kind of gone off the topic a little bit. But but for personal challenge, new knowledge, new experiences are what drive me. We're now in a situation where, let's be honest, I mean, the last four years in particular have been quite tough economically, with Brexit, with pandemic. And now with a high inflation market, supply chain issues, people issues. I mean, it's it's kind of an interesting place at the moment. What can CEOs and managing directors do to limit their liability? Well, I think one of the things you've got to admit if you're a leader is that you uh, you can never anticipate all the challenges. You 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 can anticipate some of them. You can prepare for them. Um, you can avoid doing super risky things unless you're that kind of an entrepreneur um i I've, I've never been one of those bet everything on red or bet everything on black kind of um, entrepreneurs i've always wanted to have a portfolio approach to things uh and therefore not be a brittle company i've always wanted to yes i want to be successful but at the same time i know that not everything will work out so what happens if that is if that goes wrong are we going to lose the company? No, we're not. Great. Okay, fine. Move on. We have another roll of the dice. So I think as leaders, especially in the last few years, who would have ever thought that we would have been in, first of all, a pandemic, and the pandemic would have been dealt with in the way it had to be, you know, the lockdown and the economic impacts there. And then just as we're sort of psychologically starting to sort of think that the pandemic might be over, although I don't think it actually is, but it's less lethal these days, it appears, or, or we've worked out ways of keeping people alive more than before. Um, a bloody land war in Europe. Um, I mean, and you're thinking, right, well, we can, we can prepare for marginal downturns. But for example, one of our areas of business is, um, it's called Rebellion Unplugged, which is to do with board games. And we have a big board game coming out based on one of our franchises, the Sniper Elite series. Um, and the costs for shipping that were factored in. And we'd factored in a certain, you know, when we first started the project, they, for shipping the container across from where it was being manufactured in China was, you know, five, six, seven thousand dollars sort of roughly. Um, the actual cost ended up being well over fifty thousand cool. dollars. So you're not talking about estimating five, six, seven, and it being seven, eight, nine, <laughs> you know, not even estimating it being 14 or 20, you know, you make $50,000 and very late. And you think that you couldn't do your business thinking that that tranche of costs would yeah. be a 10x. You, 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 none of your spreadsheets would work. You might as well just stop doing the business. So, 
I, you have to prepare, but you have to prepare within reasonable parameters, but you also have to be aware that things can come up that will utterly knock your predictions for six. Um, yeah, and I think a lot of people have been there right now. Their, their predictions are being knocked for six as we speak. Yes, and it's it's incredibly challenging. So what can you do? Well, I suppose you've just got to lift your head up and work out, right, what, what can we save? What can we save? How can we turn a bad thing into a better thing? Can we, for example, what might happen is you might look for local manufacturers in, in our case is exactly what we're doing we're going right well that's absurd we can't we can't rely on manufacturing in china it was going to be 50 percent cheaper but we've now had these huge costs for transportation right there's an opportunity who who do we know locally who how can we work with them to make things better how do we approach them and say right well you're much more expensive than the chinese but <laughs> getting things from china is incredibly expensive and unreliable as well expensive and unreliable is like three two things out of the three things that you really don't want to happen um but you suddenly think right how do we use fewer air miles for making our stuff how do we focus on our carbon footprint you know this is this has given us a shake-up moment this has given us one of these moments where you sit down and you go Right. Okay. Everything's cocked up. What do we, yeah. how do we get out of this mess? And I think actually that can focus the brain quite nicely. You know, when, as a leader, when you know, you are utterly foobar, you, you think, right, I'm not going to pretend anymore. It's foobar. How do, <laughs> how do we now uh, de-block it? How do we now take it from where we are to where we need to be? having to acknowledge that everything is different than we expected. And that actually can be quite invigorating for everybody hmm. because you challenge people to rise above themselves. You challenge people to think outside the box. You, you challenge people, you say, well, we, we can't do it the old way anymore. Which isn't a bad thing. Exactly. I actually think it can be quite energizing. Um, if you survive as a company, it, it can, it can kick you into a different, place um almost against your will uh i'm not saying it's comfortable but it but it actually can be a major catalyst for growth and change yeah and i think we're seeing that now across so many industries mm. what's been the biggest lesson you've learned from building a successful business uh try to do deals that work for both sides i i have always felt that I didn't want to take advantage of somebody who was in a bad situation because that feels wrong. So there have been situations where uh, outsourcers or third parties have, have put, a, put a bid in and I really want to work with them, but their bid for working with us was too cheap. And I felt it would not be responsible. I want to work with them, but I've actually been in situations where I've said, guys, right, we want to work with you, but we don't think your bid is expensive enough, is realistically expensive enough. Because we think what's going to happen is you want this deal from us and we'll, well, brilliant. You know, we're going to save a ton more money than we thought. We've got a budget, not going to tell you what it is, but it's more than you've suggested. So give us a sensible bid that gives you some margin and gives you some opportunity to then build your business off the back of working for us because i want to be working with you in the next three to five years yeah. i don't want to just I, I don't want to sort of destroy your business destroy your psychology and then move on i want to build your business so that you can help build my business and and this is sort of really weird thing that happens then um within certain parameters you 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 end up making colleagues and friends in other businesses and you end up with the right kind of people you end up them doing you favors later on that you hadn't really asked for because they know that you're a good person to work with and they'll recommend you uh and they're pleased that you've helped them run their business and you know they, they don't necessarily become best buddies but they, you know they kind of they become valued business colleagues and that way you build up a network of people that you can call on 
in in constrained circumstances or that are just more fun to work with um and as i say coming back to my thing about do cool stuff and have fun um it's much more fun to work with people that really want to be working with you than than, yeah. than have to be working with you that's a good point what advice would you give to budding entrepreneurs oh gosh that's a wide open question um what advice would i give Right. The first step, the hardest step to take in your entrepreneurial journey is the very first one to actually decide to do something. The biggest drop off between the biggest failure of business isn't actually when businesses start and fail. The biggest failure of business is people not starting the business in the first place <laughs> because it's never tracked. Nobody knows. Somebody has a good idea. Good ideas are hard to have, but you know, lots of people have good ideas, but then they don't do anything about it. So that's automatically failed. And I would say, if circumstances allow, if you can work out how to have a go, <laughs> um, because the, 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 the biggest drop off for any entrepreneur is not actually starting, not giving it a go. You might fail. In fact, probably statistically speaking, you will fail um, and failure brings growth and development as well. But you will not learn, you will not succeed if you don't actually start and try. And um, <laughs> don't be embarrassed to be a beginner. We're all a beginner at some stage in, in everything we do. And it's why I quite like personal development, going back to the beginning, trying something I've never done before and realizing I'm blooming useless at it and I've got to learn. I think that's hugely important. Um, and don't expect to be as big and successful as your business heroes that you read about in the press, because there's a whole bunch of stuff they've done that they don't popularize and they don't publicize that probably wasn't successful. <laughs> and, and they just don't talk about it. Very few people broadcast their failures. Um, very, very few people will tell you how many things they started that just collapsed or didn't work yeah. or anything like that they'll only tell you the successes so you're always getting this um confirmation bias this this survivor bias of of, of entrepreneurial stories um i i i sometimes illustrate this by explaining to people imagine you enter the lottery and you win the lottery and that doesn't mean you're better than anybody else at choosing numbers you you really aren't better you're just lucky you, you, and, and business is sometimes about luck. It's also about how you manage that luck and how you go on to, to build on it. But don't underestimate luck and timing. Um, there is probably a good time to start a business and a bad time for certain people in certain situations. So, you know, starting a business when you're just starting a family is probably asking for trouble. <laughs> you know, starting a business before you have dependents is probably easier. Um, but it doesn't mean you don't have wisdom after you've got dependents. Um, and start something then when you know uh starting a business when you've lost your job might be a really good time it might be a, a time to go right just lost a job previous company went bust on me right how do i how do i build on this this how do i make this failure into a success i've got the opportunity um so i would say just try it and see be sensible but just try it, but don't expect to be a billion dollar company overnight. Almost nobody is a billion dollar company overnight, whatever they like to tell you. Um, you know, you, you can't just do that. Nobody does it. Now, I know that you're on multiple channels. If people yeah. want to follow you yep, and sort of keep up with what you're up to and things that you're sharing, what's the best way to do that? I'm in multiple different places. So I have multiple hats. So my Modern History TV channel uh, which is just available on youtube um is all about the medieval period you'll see me talking about medieval obscure things you'll see me riding horses and using swords from horseback and that kind of thing um then i am uh rebellion jason um uh at twitter or is it Re is it jason Re jason rebellion i can't remember anyway at, at rebellion jason i think uh on twitter I, and i comment a little bit more i do a lot more on my business areas there so tips and tricks a little bit of historical stuff um science i do quite a lot of science there as well interesting scientific things um 
and also about the computer games industry, publishing and the things that we do there. I also have a podcast called Future Imperfect, which is nothing like your podcast at all. It's not really about business. It's about interesting things to do with history and science. So we did one recently about soil and how important soil is as a, as a natural resource and how fragile soil can be if it's not treated well and, and what that means for the planet. Um, we also did one on um, uh, medieval sports and jousting as well. So it's a, it's a very eclectic mix of interesting things. Um, yeah, those are the sort of the, the places really uh, to, to see my really odd smorgasbord of interests. Oh, brilliant. Well, thank you for joining us today. It's been absolutely awesome. If you've loved today's episode, please like it, share it with others and subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. If anything's resonated today, you want a bit more information, head over to borka.com and get in touch. Always remember that failing to learn is learning to fail. So please stay safe. And Jason, thank you so much for being an awesome guest. My pleasure. It's been lovely. Thank you. Thank you.